Well, hi, my name is Dean. I'm the pastor of the Lost City Church, and I want to thank you for coming and watching this video today. But I want you to go ahead and plan a visit now. And you can plan a visit by clicking on the link in the comments below. And here is why I want you to plan a visit. Because when you plan a visit, we'll have a host ready to meet you outside of our facility. They'll give you a, a personal tour of our location. They'll help you get your kids registered. They'll have a free gift waiting for you. They'll save you some seats in our auditorium and they will introduce you to me. And so you and I can finally meet face to face. It's so important for you to plan your visit now. And I want to encourage you to go ahead and do that before you watch the rest of this video. And I promise you when you come and attend Velocity that you're going to experience God, His presence and His goodness in your life. So plan your visit now and then enjoy the rest of this video. God bless you and we'll see you soon. Good morning. Um, as Pastor Dean said, I am Dave Gibson. My wife is finishing obligations at, um, at Williamsburg Assembly. She led the children's ministry for a number of years, quite a few number of years. And uh, she always says, you know, David, I don't know, feel like I've done anything. I said, I don't think I was a good pastor's wife. I said, honey, you took care of those kids and I didn't have to worry about them. And uh, the and I say that for anybody who's serving the church. If you're doing something, the pastor doesn't have to worry about you're serving the Lord. <laughs> and so just keep that in mind. I want to talk to you today as a pastor, not your pastor. This is your pastor. He's one of the finest, I got to say young, but middle-aged pastors. Um, <laughs> keep believing that. I told somebody... For you guys who are my, I'm 73, uh, and I told somebody, old age does not gradually come. It's It just comes by surprises. One day you go to bend over and you go, I can't do that anymore. Or you get down and you go, how am I going to get up? So, Johnny, when you asked me to put those boxes over there, that's the greatest fear I've had all day bending over to put those boxes and then, oh, by the way, did y'all get any shoes in your boxes? I didn't get any in mine. I didn't think so. I want to talk to you this morning about something that God has laid on my heart for my life. And so you're kind of getting an experimental message in that God has been dealing with me about being a place where heaven touches earth. And, um, uh, you know, when Jesus taught his disciples to pray, we call it the Lord's Prayer, but actually it's the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples. The Lord's Prayer happened in, uh, was it 14, 15, and 16 chapters of John. That he began this, he began to teach them by saying this. Now, I'm going to have you turn to your Bibles or your flip phones or, or scroll phones, whatever they are, in just a moment. But, um, but, but in, in Matthew's version, he, began, he told his disciples by saying this, Our Father, which was a pretty good starting sentence because it wasn't my Father or the Father of Jesus. Jesus was saying, look, we're in this together. All right? That's what our means. We're in this together. He said, Our Father, who art in heaven, how would be thy name? Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And as I was looking at this several years ago, 
I went to one of the, I, I'm not a Greek scholar, I, you know, going to Jimmy the Greeks as close as I'm going to get to Greek. Uh, but, um, but in looking at one of the books that I had, uh, the way it was phrased in that um, interlinear translation really spoke to my heart. Now, I'm a great believer in Bible study. If you don't understand it, break it up. Don't try to swallow the whole loaf at one time. Start with a phrase, then go to another phrase. And so I got to looking at this, and the way it was phrased really struck to my heart because it said, to me, it said, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name on earth as it is in heaven. Thy kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And when I saw that, I began to think, this is the way that God wants us as believers and the, ch and, and the church corporately to be. He wants us to hollow or glorify or made honored the name of the Father while on earth. Not only just on earth, but how it was being done in heaven. And he wants us to... And then he said, the way I'm figuring this thing out, is that he wants his kingdom to come on earth as it is in heaven. Now stop and think of the ramifications. Third thing, that his will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now church, is God using you to touch heaven? Or are we doing religious things? Are we doing Christian things? I had a Catholic friend of mine a long time ago many, said we were talking about, he loved to talk about religion. He talked about things. Let me back up. And, and he sounded like he knew what he was talking about until he got on religion and, and the Civil War. And I realized he didn't know squat about what he was talking about. Well, he made a statement one time, that, and he said, said oh, we were talking about religion and rituals. And I said, well, you know, the Catholics got these religious rit rit rituals. And he says, you Pentecostals have yours too. No. No, we don't. Then I had to stop and think. Yes, we do. We really do. Come on. We lift up our hands without thinking about it. We do. We, we, we sing songs. And our minds are out there in the world someplace. We say words that we're not, come on, amen? It's kind of quiet in here now. Dean, you're going to have a lot to clean up later on. The point I'm getting at is we should not be ritualistic in what we do, even if we think it is a Pentecostal thing to do. Make it mean something. When you lift your hands, Say, Lord, I surrender, or, or Father, pick me up, or whatever the case might be. Just don't do it to be doing it because then it becomes a ritual. All right, I've done enough of that. I'll quit meddling and get back to teaching. In order for you and I to be the, pl the, the place where heaven touches earth, okay, I'm sorry, I, I got ahead of myself. You have all been given a handout. Okay, I want you to put on where I left you a place to write what I'll tell you to write. So, um, so write on there, thy name be, hallowed be thy name on earth, okay? And then thy kingdom come and thy will be done. Write that down on there for me. Well, write it down there for you because I don't intend to look at it. All right, just as a reminder of what we're talking about. All right, thank you. Now I'll go back to talking. And, I, and, and wherever you have a blank spot, I'm going to give you what I want you to put in there. All right? The blank spot is for you to make your life application. I pray and been praying all week, the last two weeks, that the Holy Spirit will speak to hearts today. And if the Holy Spirit speaks to your heart, then jot a note down, something you can refer back to later. Because this is important, I believe, for us to be able to, to make this teaching 
come alive in our life. So, but you're going to have to do it on a personal level. So I will tell you what to put in the blanks. You're going to have to fill in the empty spaces. But I want to take just a moment to talk about what it means for it to be a place where heaven touches earth. In, in Habakkuk, there's a scripture that says in chapter 2, verse 14, says the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. And we like that. But stop and think for just a moment. The phrase, as the waters cover the sea. What makes up the sea? Not a trick question. Water. So do we, should we say, as the seas cover the seas? As the water covers the water? See, the only way for this thing to work out, what is the sea? Nothing, the sea is nothing more than a whole bunch of drops of water. In other words, I believe what we can learn from this is that we are to be, for the, for the, for the waters to cover the sea, we, they have to be of the same substance. And for you and I to be a place where heaven can touch earth, we've got to be in this, have the same substance as what is in heaven. Now, I've got a handy little illustration for you. I've got a machine over here. I got a power source, a, a big old one of those uh, power grid thing, power plants. That's what I'm trying to get. And the only thing connected that, that power plant, and this machine is a wire. Now you can pick that wire up. You can handle it. You can put it in your mouth and do whatever you want to with it. It won't hurt you. It's just there. Do you want to be a Christian who's just there? But if I want this machine to run, then I got to take this wire and plug it in. Now, as soon as I plug that wire into some outlet, that wire is filled with juice, with electricity. Now you don't touch it. Now you don't put it in your mouth. Now you don't play with it. Why? The wire hasn't changed. What's changed? The substance flowing through it. It took the substance of the power plant to flow through that wire to get that machine going. That's what God wants for us today. To be a place where we're plugged into a power plant so that we might take on the substance of that power plant to get that machine going. Now, I want to take you to a story. I want you to turn to 2 Kings uh, chapter, um, it's got to hear somewhere, chapter 5. I apologize, I'm on the back end of a coal and I'm dry as toast. And so, and when you're dry, dry as toast, that's, when you're dry as toast, that's when you get the little white things there, okay? Um, I want you to turn to 2 Kings chapter 5. And this is the story of the healing of Nahum. Naaman. Anybody heard this story before? Raise your hands. I, well, it's the only time I ask you to raise your hands. If you know, if you're familiar with this story, raise your hands. Keep it up so I can say, come on. You mean you guys have never heard it before? Oh, come on. Now you just ruined everything I was going to say. For those who know this thing and not are too religious, so we're not going to put God as, uh, we're not going to answer God. Who's the hero of this story? Who would you say the hero of this story is? Do you all know the story? Huh? Yeah, I said not God. I said we're going to accept that as a given. Who's the guy, who's the guy we talk about? Huh? Elisha, I'll help you out here. Don't you teach these guys? Oh, never mind. Is Elisha. He would be the one, if you went to Sunday school class, they would say, Elisha and Naaman. Maybe they can go to Sunday school. But I want you to, so having said that, since you didn't, 
I want you to keep that in mind because Elisha was a prophet. Let me tell you something a little bit about Elisha. Elisha was a servant of, uh, of Elijah. And by the way, during this message, if I say Elijah, I mean Elisha, don't correct me. All right? Say he's 73 years old and never was bright at all. He was a servant of Elijah. What's so special about Elijah? I'll tell you what it is. He never died. God took him. He was such a man of God that God sent the chariots from heaven to, to take him up, to translate him. But Elisha was his servant. But Elisha had a ministry that, that would have not been popular in today's society because Elijah is best known for proclaiming a drought. And he was, he was hated by everybody around, all the power structure around him. People would go to Elisha if he was living today because he did a lot of miracles. He did an awful, he, he was a, most of the, the, the miracles in, I believe, in the, New Te, in the Old Testament were done by him. So he would have been the more popular guy. People knew who, would know who he was. Elisha was a man that God used in a lot of different ways. But he's not the hero of this story. So if you will, turn in your Bibles with me to 2 Kings chapter 5. We're going to start with verse 1. We're going to read through 14. And I'm going to have to get this a lot closer to my face than what it is. Now Naaman, captain of the army of the king of Aram, was a great man with his a great man with his master and highly respected because by him the Lord had given victory to Aram. Now when you hear the word Aram, you can also use the word Assyria because Assyria was another name for a, for Aram. The man was a, also a valiant warrior, but he was a leper. Now the Armenians had gone out in, in out in bands and had taken captive of a little girl from the land of Israel. And she waited on Naaman's wife. And she said to her mistress, I wish that my master were here with the prophet who is, who is in Samaria. Then he would cure him of his leprosy. And Naaman went in and told his master, saying, Thus and thus spoke the little girl, spoke the girl who is from the land of Israel. Then the king of Aram said, Now go, go now. And I will send a letter to the king of Israel. And he departed and took with him ten talents of silver and six thousand shekels of gold and ten changes of clothes. And he brought the letter to the king of Israel. By the way, he, his name was Jehoram. Saying, and now, and now as this letter comes to you, behold, I have sent Naaman, my servant, to you so that you may cure him of, the, of his leprosy. And when it came about when the king of Israel heard, uh, read the letter he, that he tore his clothes and said, Am I God to kill or make alive? This man is sending word to me to cure a man of his leprosy. But consider now and see how he is seeking a quarrel against me. And it happened when Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his clothes, that he sent word to the king saying, Why have you torn your clothes? Now let, let him come to me, and he shall know that there is a prophet in Israel. So Naaman came with his horses and his chariots, and he stood at the doorway of the house of Elijah, Elisha. And Elisha sent a messenger to him, saying, Go and wash in the Jordan seven times, and your flesh will be restored to you, and you shall be clean. But Naaman was furious and went away and said, Behold, I thought... Behold, I thought he, he would surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the, of the Lord his God and wave his hand over the place and cure the leper. Are not Abdonai and, and Far, Farpar, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? <laughs> Could I not wash in, in them and be clean? So he turned and went away in a rage. But one of his servants came near came near and spoke to him and said, My father, 
had the prophet told you to do something, to do some great thing, would you not have done it? How much more then when he says to you, wash and be clean? So he went down and he dipped himself seven times in the Jordan, according to the word of the Lord of the man of God, and his flesh was restored like the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. Now keep your Bibles there. Keep your cell phones on, uh, on, uh, on this subject because we're going to go through a Bible study. The first thing we're going to look at is Naaman, is Naaman. So in your blank spot, I want you to write down the place, a place where heaven, where needing a touch from heaven, a place needing a touch from heaven. If you and I should look at Naaman, and maybe we would, get, we would look at others in our society the same way. <clears throat> if you and I should look at him afar, what would we see? Well, Scripture's given us quite a, a description of this fellow. He would be the... He was the supreme commander of the army of the Assyrians, which were the most powerful army in that, in that area, in the Middle East, during Elisha's time. We would see that he had a high position, that he moved among the elite. Whenever they had a cocktail party, he was there. He was a confidant of the king. We learn later on, if you read the story further than what we read, that he, would have, that he even went to the same church as the king. He was highly respected and admired by his society. And I want you to also notice, and it's kind of interesting, I just wrote that, this down this morning, he was used by God. That's what the Bible says. And God used him to, 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 to have victory to have military victories. He was a victorious general, therefore he was successful in his field, and he was a valiant warrior. He probably would have been a superstar in today's society. If you looked at him from afar, he would be somebody that everybody wanted to be. But if you got up close to him, you see an entirely different picture. He was a leper. He was a man who was now disfigured. He had a blighted future. However, the most, his, his greatest affliction, though he did not know it, was his pride. You see, now he would have been a man nobody wanted to be. Now, I said that because I wanted you to see something. We're humans here, right? Don't we sometimes look at somebody and say, if I share the message of Jesus with them, they won't listen. Everything's going right in their life. And you know what? They probably won't. But that doesn't stop us from sharing through words or actions or deeds the love of Jesus. Because, because in every unsaved individual, there is a disease. And that disease is called sin. And sin will have its consequences. I had a, 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 I saw in the paper a little while ago, a guy, a daughter of a guy I went to school with. She just passed away 40, I think she's 42 years old. And I, because we're doing this, I'm not going to say any more about it except this. The man was very successful. But I'll, I would well imagine he'd trail everything he owned to have his daughter back. Beloved, every person needs Jesus. And if we're not going to tell them, then who's going to? So don't let that discourage you. Don't make that assumption. You don't know if that person who, who is uh, it seems like they got it all together. Is having a marriage that's breaking up or having a child on drugs or, or, or having a child that's a, a, a loved one who's diseased. <laughs> you don't know that because you look at afar. Don't assume be a place where heaven touches earth. Now, the first person we're introduced to after Naaman is somebody 
whose name is not, we don't know. But I want you to look at this. In that spot beside the slave girl, I want you to write, can I give grace? Now, I did not say may I give grace or should I give grace. I'm going to put it, I want to put it this way, can I give grace? Look at this young lady's life. Now, we are not given the details except that, 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 that a band of Armenians, a band of Assyrians, went into Israel on a raid, and she became a captive. But we could pretty much surmise, I think, that her parents were dead. And the worst case scenario would be that she saw her parents die, get killed in front of her eyes, which would not be an uncommon occurrence. We don't know if she was the daughter of a noble. We don't know, we, we don't know anything about her. But this is what we do know, that she was in, she, that, that, that Naaman was ultimately responsible for the position, for the experience she had to go through and the position she was in. And now she finds herself in Naaman's house waiting on Naaman's wife. You know what? I got something spiritual about this. God put her in this place. God put her in this place. I'm sure she didn't appreciate it when God did it. She may have nights where she woke, where she cried out, God, why? But the bottom line is, God put her in this place. She could have easily said, uh, yeah, let him, let him just... Let him suffer like I suffered. I hope he hurts like I hurt. I, I, I rejoice in, in, the, in, the, uh, evil, in the evil that he's going to have to go through for the rest of his life. She could easily have said that, and we would say she would be justified. How many times have we said they're only getting what they deserve? They're only getting what they deserve. But somewhere along the line, this young lady learned grace. More than likely, it was from the parents that were taken from her. And this grace was just not something she learned as much as it, as it was ingrained in her. That's why I use the question, can I? Because there are times that only the in grace, the ingrained grace, grace of God is going to enable us to do what our flesh does not want to do, what our mind doesn't want to do. We've got to look at people and give them and say, God, can I give them grace? You walk by somebody who you know has brought about tragedy after tragedy in his own family, and the flesh says he's getting or she's getting what, what they deserve. Then you'll be able, then you'll be able to say, ah, oh, but the grace of God. The grace of God. What is it? What? To, I, to me, she gives a, a tremendous definition of grace. She re refused the opportunity for revenge and offered hope. I don't know about you, I don't have a whole lot of money. I'm just a poor old preacher. We're tired of that. But I want you to know God's met my every need. I'm okay. I don't have a lot. But, beloved, each one of us can give grace. Every one of us can give grace. You want to be a place where heaven, start, where heaven touches earth? Start with giving the grace of God. Because that is the substance of Jesus Christ. The next front one we run into is King Jehoram. And that's the last time I'm going to say that. Who we are, and I'm going to just spend a minute or two with him because I, I know you guys have dinner at 1130. And by the way, let me know when it's 1 o'clock, will you, Dean? Okay, appreciate it. Just somebody whistle. You run into Jeho to the king of Israel, who I think is, the only reason I'm, I'm bringing him out is because he's, re he's, he's really set in opposition to this slave girl. She, he had everything she did not. Position, power, wealth, popularity, uh, uh, people waiting on him hand and foot. 
<laughs> he had everything she did not. But when he gets the message, hey, from the king of Assyria, and says, look what I'm going to do for you, King Jehoram. I'm going to let you heal my servant. Lucky you. The Bible says that he tore his robes. What does that mean? It means it was an expression of fear and frustration. And then he says, the king is trying, this Assyrian guy, king, is trying to start something. He's looking for a reason to go to war with me. How many of you guys remember that old song in the 50s, Charlie Brown? Anybody remember that but me? Oh, come on. You guys can't be that young. Thank you, Carolyn. The line that I, there's a line in that song that says, why is everybody always picking on me? All right. Now I've got a few confessors here. His reaction, the, the, the girl's reaction, the slave girl who's in the, in the mully grubs of life, renders grace. He says, I'm being picked on. Have you ever felt like you are picked on? Put that on your, on your list right there. Am I being picked on? Do you feel like God's picked on you? Put you in a play, put you in a position to, that, 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 that he's just making, it look, making you look bad? Am I being picked on? Well, I got news for you. You and I can't see the will of God if we feel like we're being picked on. It, you know why we can't see the will of God? Because, he's too, because we are too busy looking at ourselves. Feel like you're being picked on? Get beyond looking at you and get your eyes back on Jesus. Get a slave girl's mentality. God, enable me to give grace. The next person we run into is Jehazi. And put on there a question, am I willing to be committed? Am I willing to be committed? Because you cannot be a place where heaven touches earth if you're not willing to commit yourself to the mission. Am I willing to be committed? And that's why I gave you all those blank spaces. I want you to think about these things. For us to be effective as the body of Christ, no matter what church we attend, no matter where we, where, what neighborhood we live in, if we're not willing to, to, to commit to be in a place where heaven is going to is, can touch earth, heaven's not going to touch earth. Not through you anyway. Now, Jehazi is an interesting fellow. We're not, he, was, he was Elisha's servant. In other words, he was to Elisha what Elisha was to Elijah. I got through that and said all the names right. I'm so proud of myself. As his servant, he was a participant in delivering a positive message. And I got the scriptures, verses if you want, but I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time there. He was a participant in a healing. He was a participant in restoration. And in that restoration thing, it says he was talking with a king. So he had access in some form or fashion to power. But now he was being commissioned by Elisha to give Naaman an uncomfortable message. And it was uncomfortable to, Eli to Jehazi because he didn't want to be in that place that, that, that Elisha was putting him in. Naaman, this close to the second most powerful man in, in the then known world for those guys, <laughs> shows up, <excuse> me, <clears throat> shows up with, with a, a whole bunch of money, shows up with, with a whole bunch of goods, shows up with an entourage. I mean, he just didn't walk and tap on the door. He had a slew of people and a bunch of uh, animals packed with goods and, and, and wealth of all kinds. 
pretty impressive uh, 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 ex expression of power, of wealth, of authority. He shows up with the idea, we'll get back to this in a minute, with the idea that Elisha was going to come out of the door, uh, come out of the house, go, oh, you're sick. Wave his hand over the leper, and the leper and, and the leper should be gone. Let me throw a little interlude in here. Now wait till later. No, 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 because I'm about to forget it later. Quit telling God how to do with his miracles. Quit telling God how to do his miracles. Too often we get frustrated. Come on. We're praying somebody's sick and we go, oh, God, this is an excellent opportunity for you to heal somebody and get all kinds of glory. We, we set it out for God. We, said, we, we put all the ducks in a row. Said, now, if you just, hey, 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 listen to me. If you will just follow this thing, oh, how wonderful it's going to be for you. Let me tell you something. Our God runs the show. And he's doing things in your life and in the lives of other people that you don't know the first thing about. You're not in this thing by yourself. Your life is eternal. And because your life is eternal, you, you, you're not just touching the immediate, you're touching the everything. And you don't know what God is doing over here and over here and over here that when he's ready to do, he's got all of his, he's got all of his ducks in a row and all of the ducks fall down. Too often, I believe we get frustrated because we tell God what to do, and he doesn't do it like we want him to do it. That's what happened to Naaman. The Bible says he turned in a rage because it didn't happen the way he thought it ought to happen. All right, that's called jumping ahead, okay, in case you're wondering. He was uncomfortable, so now Elisha goes to Jehazi, the, the, the second most powerful man in the world, in their in their world, is outside the door, and he goes, uh, "Be like you going, hey, uh, a son, daughter, go out there and talk to that guy. I'm not going out to meet him. I'm not going out to talk to him. I'm sending you to talk to him. Wait, wait a minute. You're going, you're going to put me out there. He's going to get insulted. That kind of thing isn't done." You're making, you're making me, your servant, do your job. And God says, yes, I am. If you want to be a place where heaven touches earth, you're going to have to do the works of Christ. You're going to have to do his job. He was uncomfortable. I know I would be. If the... And I don't care what you think about him. He's still the president of the United States. As the president of the United States came to the door and said, hey, I want to see Dean. And Dean says, David, go talk to him. I ain't going to go. He wants you. He will hit me. The point I'm getting at is simply this. Sometimes God is going to put you in a place where you don't want to be to bring an uncomfortable message. Yay, praise God. Now you know why I retired. He knew what Naaman's reaction was going to be. But he was still sent. When you talk to somebody, you may know what their reaction is going to be, but that doesn't stop you. You got a commission. Are you willing to be commissioned? You see, Naaman had to hear. what God had to say. And so Jehazi had to give it. Church, the world needs to hear what Jesus has to say. And you and I have been commissioned to give that word. We may not like it. We may feel uncomfortable about it. We imagine all kinds of things. People think we're too religious or too this or too that. doesn't make any difference. You've been commissioned to give a message Go into all the world and preach the gospel. Hello. That's it. Understand this. You have been commissioned 
to give a message, to bring a message from heaven. In no other way can you be a place where heaven touches earth. It is not our job to debate, to argue, to compromise with the receiver. It's not our job. It's our job to give the message. Don't get into a discussion of evolution. Tell them Jesus loves them. Let God take care of what he can take care of, what he does a lot better than you and I do. You are not the author of the message. Jesus is. You're just an ambassador. He was to repeat it exactly. He was not to add to it. He was not to subtract from it and preachers in the place. He was not to embellish it. Give the word of God. Give the word that God has given to you. And we're going to talk about this in a few minutes, but keep that in mind. Understand, Jehazi was delivering Elisha's promise. You and I are commissioned to deliver the promise of God. It's not our place. Write it down. It, no, I don't care if you write it down or not. Write it down in your heart. It's not your job to do a miracle. You ain't good enough. It's God's, but, but if you're a place where heaven touches earth, a miracle is going to occur. Ain't no way in the world heaven's going to touch earth and things are going to be the same. What is our responsibility? Our responsibility is to obey without hesitation. All right, we're almost at the end of it. Here now, Naaman accepts this, or hears this thing, and he reacts the way that Jehaz I probably thought he was going to. And so he turns around in rage and, and, and makes a statement, aren't the, the rivers in Damascus cleaner than these are and better than these are? But one of his lieutenants, now it says his lieutenants, but one guy spoke, or a service, but one of the guys spoke up. Here's what I want you to write in that last empty spot. Am I in a place to render perspective? Am I in the place to render perspective? Naaman, like I said earlier, had decided how he was going to be delivered. He wanted healing. God wanted humility. Guess who won? If you don't know, look at, the, look at verse 14. You see, God did not, God was not worried about name his body. He could have healed that any time, any place. His concern was name his pride. And the way he chose to do this was to put him in the old stinky, dirty uh, River Jordan. And he had to dip seven times, not one, not five, not six, seven times. But notice how the, I love this guy. I don't know his name, but I love this guy. I love the way, notice the way with me how this lieutenant approached him. First of all, he used Naaman's pride to communicate a truth. We don't need to pound people with the Bible that most of them have not read some at, at any time. We love to quote Scripture, don't we? I had a superintendent's wife when she, they were pastoring in Silver, in, in Silver Springs, Maryland. They had a young son who, who was in a car accident and died. And I remember talking to her years later when she visited, when, when brothers and sisters Spruill visited our church, and she said, she was talking about Butchie was his name, he said, when Butchie died, said, if I thought if somebody came up to me and quoted, all things work together for good according to, the, according to the, those who love God or however it goes, she said, I screamed. You see, she didn't need another scripture. She knew what the scripture was. She needed, she needed perspective. We can give perspective. 
the, 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 the lieutenants knew enough about Naaman that if he would, that if he, if, um, that he had enough pride that he could use their pride, that they could use that pride to get across a message, a perspective. He says, sir, you're absolutely, this is a Gibson translation. Sir, you're absolutely right. The waters are, the guy just doesn't even respect you, didn't even, didn't even come out to see you. He said, now he wants you to dip in this Jordan. Our rivers are definitely better than theirs. See, you got to read between the lines. It's in there. But here's the thing, sir. If he'd asked you to do something great, wouldn't you have done it? Well, we can put it in church terms. If he asked you to preach a message or sing a song or teach a class or, or head up a, 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 a committee, wouldn't you have done it? Why not do something small? Because when it's all said and done, sir, you're absolutely right. You got every right to get mad. You 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 can you you're a man who, who's of, of accomplishment. Yes, sir, you're absolutely right to get mad. But sir, you're still a leper. And beloved, that gave Naaman perspective. We need to give perspective to people based on the Word of God. Don't get me wrong. Based on, your, on the Word of God that is within you and, and the Word that's part of your, ingrained in your life. But you don't need to beat them over the head with a Bible. They've got to see for themselves the perspective of heaven. And some of the, some of the most precious people on the, in the kingdom of God, people who heaven has touched earth, has done nothing more than put an arm around somebody and said, I'm here for you. Not give them a, 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 a litany of their experiences. But trust God through the Holy Spirit to do what he does best, and you just love them. Give them perspective. Help them to see that it isn't over with. It's not the end, it's not the end of days. It's not the thing that's going to, that, that, that the, the world did not stop today. But that God has still got a plan for you. God's still got a life for you. God still has something for you to accomplish. And when you're ready, he's going to pick you up. He's going to dust you off. He's going he's to lift up your head, and together you guys are going forward. Maybe you can't do it right now. Maybe the hurt is too deep. Maybe the brokenness is, is too shattered. But God still has hope for you. God has not given up on you. And if you have a relationship with that person, they're going to take that and they're going to hear from heaven because somebody was willing to be a place where heaven touched earth. So here's what I want to finish with. What brought about this miracle? What is it, Elisha? He didn't have anything to do with it. The only thing he did was tell Jehazi, Jehazi, to give a message. This, mess, this miracle could have not have been done if there wasn't a slave girl, girl who put aside her, 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 her hurt, her brokenness, to say, oh, that my master was in Jerusalem because there's a prophet there that can heal, her, heal him. It was a it was a a, a a a a a a messenger who said, "Yes, this is uncomfortable, but I'm willing to obey. I'm bringing not a condemnation, but a message from heaven." And it was a servant, a lieutenant, who gave a perspective that enabled that enabled Naaman to go to the place where the miracle would be completed. You see, all three of them were used by heaven to touch earth. And the reason why I'm bringing this up this morning is because each one of us, there's no Elisha here. But there are plenty of slave girls and boys. There are plenty servants. There are plenty lieutenants who, if their heart cry was, God, 
Let me be a place where heaven touches earth. Then I'll be satisfied. Let me do my part for the kingdom of God. They did not, no one person did it by themselves. But together in unity, working, even though they didn't know they were doing it, working in unity, God's, God was glorified on earth as he was in heaven. God, the kingdom came on earth as it was in heaven. And his will was done on earth as it was in heaven. And a body was healed and a life was changed to the glory of God. Lord Jesus, today we come before you. Lord, and where our cry today is, or where it should be, make me a place where heaven touches earth. I'm not looking to be an Elijah. Lord, I'm not looking to be a, a Moses or a Paul or a Peter. I'm just looking to be a servant, a place where you can touch earth. Glory to God. A place where you can touch hearts and lives. I'm not looking to build a, 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 a mega ministry. I just want to be used through the Holy Spirit so that it, to be filled with the same substance of heaven so I can be a wire that will turn on the engine and make it go. In Jesus' name, for your glory and for your glory only. So this morning... I ask you, Lord, speak to all of our hearts. Speak to all of our hearts today. It doesn't matter the size or how long we've been in, the, in serving the Lord. It could be a few days. It could be 50, 60 years. It doesn't matter. Let us be a place where heaven touches earth. And God, let us be made of the same substance of heaven. Let us serve as only you can. I want to close with this this morning. You want to be a place where heaven touches earth? You want to be a place where heaven touches earth? Are you willing to say, Lord, fill me with the substance of heaven? If you, I want you to just slip out of your chair. I want you to just join me up here. I want to pray for you. I don't want you to come if you don't want if if you don't feel like you can. That's okay. That's okay. I'm praying that that God will do it. God will God will move you. But but if you want to be a place where heaven touches earth, right now I want you to get up out of your chair and come and join me up here. To God be the glory. To God be the glory. Hallelujah. Glory to God. I, I don't beg. I'm not going to beg you. If the Holy Spirit's speaking to you, you should be obedient uh, obedient right now. To God be the glory. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Then stand with me. To God, stand with me. Everybody stand with me.